Hello again, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for this Monday's edition of Alaska Weather. I'm meteorologist Dave Percy, and I'll be hosting today's show. Up uh, first, uh, fire weather graphic. Uh, just some areas of high fire danger here, north side of the uh, eastern Alaska range, for example, and then northwest side there of the Alaska range. And uh, an area of the Copper River Basin that actually goes to very high, in some cases, uh, extreme. And then more extreme up there over the Yukon Flats where it's been for quite some time surrounded by high to very high fire danger that extends eastward, a little to the south here, and more extreme fire danger up uh, along the Western Brooks Range uh, spilling actually into the north slope there all the way out to the coastline, a little bit there over the Western Seward Peninsula. And so, some areas here in the Central Ontario had a fair amount of precipitation uh, over the last 24 hours. Like uh, just today, Ruby picked about eight tenths of an inch of precipitation, while uh, Northway had uh, nearly half an inch. And that's associated with the heavier showers and thunderstorms. On satellite, you can see clouds moving west to east here across the Arctic coast and North Slope. That on the south side of a uh, jet that's a little farther to the north there, but close enough to uh, bring some pretty good rainfall along the Arctic coast and uh, locally into the North Slope. Up to four tenths of an inch to half an inch fell over the central areas there. For example, Atchisook had about 0.48 inches today, and uh, other areas uh, had quarter of an inch or lighter, and then that cuts off there at the Brooks Range. A couple of thunderstorms developing uh, near and just east of Arctic Village this afternoon. A couple of lightning strikes there on the outer edge of that cloud shield. Otherwise, uh, the sunshine here from the Yukon Delta up across Norton Sound and the Seward Peninsula and into the central interior areas. And again, that triggered, uh, uh, allowed the temperatures warm enough to trigger some thunderstorm activity. Nothing in the central interior as of 3 p.m., most of it over in Canada, a couple of strikes up there to the north and then uh, over toward the Lotto Hills. There was one or two strikes earlier today in the Susitna Valley and then back along the Western Alaska Range. Otherwise, uh, wet conditions, rain began to taper off or become a little lighter and more intermittent for Kodiak Island there after picking up a fair amount with this uh, band of clouds associated with a front. Right, and that moisture spread right up into the North Gulf Coast area where Cordova had uh, just under an inch of rain in the 12-hour period ended at 3 p.m. this afternoon, about a quarter of an inch at Yakutat, and then also uh, some moisture here, showers brought uh, rainfall two areas of the southeast coast. It was a little more varied and variable there where, uh, let's see, Petersburg had six tenths of an inch of precipitation, one of the heavier amounts down there. Uh, otherwise, uh, much lighter amounts uh, in some areas had nothing at all. Also, North Gulf Coast here, I mentioned the just uh, 0.92 inches exactly at Cordova. And uh, Seward picked up about six tenths of an inch as well, with uh, some areas picking up a third of an inch down here over the southern Cook Inlet area, lighter amounts into Bristol Bay, and out over the uh, or out over the Bering Sea, uh, same old pattern going on, a lot of cloudiness, uh, low clouds, fog, areas of drizzle, although a little more uh, rain than drizzle falling at St. George Island. They had about a third of an inch of precipitation today with uh, low pressure and some of this moisture here, but uh, a lot of low clouds, fog, and IFR across the Aleutians. On the chart today, there's that trough that brought that rainfall into the St. Paul, St. George area today, and uh, a lot of cloudiness, and then that linked up with the moisture here of that uh, washing out front that's uh, moving northward here, moved northward, a lot of precipitation with that and some of that right in the, began tapering off Kodiak, moved into the Bristol Bay area. Southern Cook Inlet uh, had a few hundredths of an inch over Northern Cook Inlet today, and then some thunderstorms beginning to develop. I mentioned Susitna Valley here in, in the Lotto Hills. This one hadn't actually happened yet, but, but it will in that area there. I believe Indian Mountain or the uh, Koyukuk, maybe Kobuk Valley areas, as well as along the Alaska Range, probably into the uh, Upper Tanaw Valley, 40 mile country, you'll see some lightning strikes here over the next few hours. Otherwise, uh, showers 
light is still over the southern southeast coast, with the exception of Petersburg. And uh, showery Kodiak Island and the Alaska Peninsula weak system way out west are just keeping the uh, IFR conditions with fog and drizzle, western Aleutians. And for tonight, uh, again, a series of uh, systems bring up uh, pretty gusty winds. Could see gusty winds along the western Arctic coast, and that'll result, could result in elevated sea levels up to around five feet. Uh, for some minor beach erosion uh, tonight into early tomorrow up there, and that's the western Arctic coast. Otherwise, the east side, less of a chance of precipitation with that warm front there and less wind as well. Fair to the south, narrow band of uh, diminishing showers and thunderstorms here <clears throat> from the Yukon Delta right up to the eastern Brooks Range. Areas of smoke uh, still in the central interior. Scattered showers along the North Gulf Coast tonight. And uh, not a lot of change out over the Bering Sea, probably lighter precipitation amounts for places like the Perbilofs. Still kind of showery there for Kodiak Island with that trough. And then a new front here develops along a trough uh, kind of coming up from the southwest. A weak low pressure area, but that'll begin to uh, push some rain in toward the southeast coast uh, late tonight by early tomorrow. Otherwise, just a few isolated showers, mostly cloudy skies and light winds. Then tomorrow, the chances of rain increase throughout the day as that uh, weak system pushes inland or pushes eastward there toward the southeast coast. Rainfall uh, looks like mostly will stay off the uh, coast here and in the Gulf of Alaska. Some of that will spread back into the Seward area, possibly, or the uh, southern Seward Peninsula area, which includes Seward, and possibly Cordova. Otherwise, a day, again, much like today with the uh, daytime heating, resulting in scattered thunderstorms across uh, mostly the eastern interior here, back to the west, and even possibly down in the northeastern Bristol Bay. Showery conditions with that low up over the northeast interior and dries out over the north slope, probably partly and mostly sunny through this area, even though I didn't put any of the uh, sand traps up there. It'll be dry for the, at least, or definitely it'll be dry, precipitation free. That'll be back along the western Arctic coast. And some of this moisture might spread into St. Lawrence Island. And then the outlook for Wednesday, uh, increasing sunshine here, Cook Inlet, Seward Peninsula, maybe even the uh, Manuska Valley. Thunderstorm chances though, Talkeetna Mountains, the Sitna Valley, western Alaska range, uh, up into the eastern interior, and uh, otherwise uh, some rain pushes across the southern southeast coast, high pressure back in over the Aleutians and southern Bering Sea. And for lows uh, tonight, 50s to lower 60s from the northeast here, all the way back to the southwest coast, 40s for the central Arctic coast, mid to upper 40s for the Aleutians, and 50s for the Panhandle, highs tomorrow mostly in the 60s for the Panhandle. 75 to 80 over the central eastern interior, 70 to 75 back to the west, lower 70s to Sitna Valley, followed by lows the following morning, a little bit cooler, uh, mid to upper 50s over the central and northeast interior, lower 50s back toward the coast, and then uh, whoop, uh, looking at upper 40s to mid 50s for the panhandle, lower 50s here for the Alaska Peninsula, mid 40s or mid to upper 40s, Perbloffs and the Aleutians, near 50 for St. Lawrence Island, and central Arctic coast down into the upper 30s, followed by highs, 75 to 82 over the eastern interior, 70s to sit in the valley, Kenai Peninsula, down into northeast Bristol Bay. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. First line weather graphic here for Tuesday morning. IFR over the uh, northern Bering Sea, eastern Bering, right down to the uh, north shore of the Fox Islands, western Alaska Peninsula. Also IFR there over the western Aleutians, some marginal VFR, ADAC and ATCA. IFR and over the uh, Bristol Bay area here, right on, actually uh, through the uh, Kamishak Gap there, right into the western portions of Kachemak Bay, or Kamishak Bay. <laughs> and the interior, mostly VFR, central western Arctic coast there, uh, more prone to the uh, IFR conditions, kind of a offshore, more of a south component here, keeping maybe even the VF, marginal VFR just off the coast of the eastern Beaufort Sea. Lingering marginal VFR along and south of central western Alaska range, IFR for the Panhandle, and that breaks out to marginal VFR for all of the southeast coast tomorrow. VFR showing up here though from uh, areas west of Yakutat all the way across Prince William Sound, VFR Kodiak Island tomorrow afternoon, all of the interior, and uh, marginal VFR on the Arctic coast, IFR lingering there coming down or through the Bering Strait uh, to just north of St. Paul, otherwise uh, marginal to IFR conditions across the central southern Bering Sea. And then for the uh, Wednesday morning outlook, IFR a little more prevalent uh, than Tuesday afternoon here, but still marginal there for ADAC and uh, possibly ATCA Island, or ATCA and possibly ADAC. 
IFR out to the west, IFR to the north, back southeastward here to the uh, eastern Aleutians, and a little bit into Bristol Bay. VFR over the interior, some marginal VFR sneaks up on into uh, the uh, southern Kodiak Island area. But good VFR for the Gulf of Alaska, North Gulf Coast here, and then marginal VFR over the Panhandle, some lingering IFR redevelops there, say uh, the uh, Metlakatla and Net Ketchikan on over to uh, Stewart. And then for Wednesday afternoon, lingering marginal VFR, big improvement here, mostly VFR actually for the southeast coast and the Gulf of Alaska. And from the North Gulf Coast, Kodiak Island, Bristol Bay, right on up into the interior. Got uh, moisture creating some marginal VFR conditions from the northwest coast along the north side of the Brooks Range. And now the central and eastern Wilford Sea coast, a little more prone to, uh, especially the east side here, maybe some IFR into the afternoon. Marginal VFR, Seward, or the Seward Peninsula, on up into Kotzebue and the Notak Valley. IFR, south side of the uh, St. Lawrence Island area, right on down to the western, across the western bearing to the western Aleutians. Marginal VFR here for the remainder of the area. Passes, Anatovic and Adigan, looking good uh, tomorrow. Another VFR day for both passes. And uh, Lake Clark and Merrill, VFR, it'd be some clouds and uh, risk of a thunderstorm, but uh, staying above the uh, marginal threshold, definitely. Rainy, VFR, windy, VFR, risk of a thunderstorm there, as well as Isabel and Mentasta, both VFR. And for Tanita, a great day tomorrow, uh, VFR there. And for Portage, uh, look for some IFR possibly in the morning hours. Might only be marginal, but uh, I'd go with IFR, and that'll be improving. That's a general trend. Uh, by Probably by noontime, it'll be VFR, if not sooner, through the afternoon. Chilkoot and White looks pretty marginal. And for the uh, freezing levels, a couple of cool pockets here traveling slowly eastward here. We got one out over the central Aleutians uh, by tomorrow morning. Uh, with an upper level low and a stronger upper level low here just south of Kodiak associated with this pocket. So we got uh, generally 8,000 feet across southern Alaska into the Panhandle and then warming up to about 10,000 feet there for the uh, Chukchi Sea across the north slope on into the uh, Northwest Territories. And for the icing, uh, best chance would be here the greatest threat is going to be with that system pushing into the Panhandle. Got some areas of uh, considerable moderate approaching the coastline uh, into the afternoon there, otherwise light to isolate moderate uh, above about 9,000 feet, above about 7,000 here. This is really just a slight chance of some icing with that uh, patch of moisture. And then with those uh, weak disturbances traveling eastward there along the Arctic coast, chance of some light icing there as well as the central Aleutians. Jet stream, uh, strong jet here across the Pacific, well south of the area, one branch cutting up across the southern panhandle. There's that 60 to 70 knot westerly jet along and just north of the Arctic coast, 9,000 feet. Uh, pretty light winds over the interior, west-southwest 25 knots along the Arctic coast, otherwise light even out over the Aleutians. South 25 coming in, or 20 to 25 along the southeast coast up toward uh, Cape Yakutaga and Cape St. Elias at 3,000 feet, maybe 25 off the coast there. Otherwise, uh, 25 westerlies on the Arctic coast. Moderate chop, pretty likely over the, southern, or over the southeast coast tomorrow. Polarization technology is a major upgrade to the current radar system. It allows forecasters a better idea of what's actually out there and can help keep you safe. Current radar technology uh, transmits and receives information in the horizontal direction, which is very limited. Dual polarization technology, in addition to the horizontal, transmits and receives uh, vertical energy, which allows forecasters to get information about the size, shape, and phase of the precipitation. We can use that information to better determine the precipitation type to expect at your given location. There you have it. This new technology is currently being installed in radars across the country and is already being used by National Weather Service forecasters to produce better, more accurate forecasts. Learn more here and follow us. Want to know about the future of weather radar? 
Well, the National Severe Storms Lab has it here with its new phased array radar. Let's check it out. It's a non-moving radar. It has four faces of the antenna, each pointing in different directions. One of the big advantages is that we're seeing so far, it can sample the, the area around the radar in less than a minute, maybe even a half a minute. And this is five, six times faster than what they can do today. NSSL is leading the development of future weather radar with this project. Learn more here and follow us. The Storm Prediction Center is one of the NOAA weather partners. They are located in the National Weather Center in Norman, Oklahoma. Greg Carbon gives us a glimpse into what the SPC does. Our mission is to analyze and forecast severe thunderstorms and the potential for tornadoes, large hail, and damaging winds from those thunderstorms across the lower 48 states, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. One of the primary missions of the Storm Prediction Center is the issuance of severe thunderstorm and tornado watches across the country when conditions appear to be coming together to support the development of severe thunderstorms and tornadoes. The world-class meteorologists in the Storm Prediction Center specialize in severe weather and keeping you safe. Learn more here and follow us. The National Severe Storms Lab is working on increasing the lead time for severe weather warnings. The national average for tornado warnings is currently 13 minutes, but more notice would be helpful, especially for those in charge of moving large groups to shelter. Warn on Forecast will help forecasters issue hazardous weather warnings earlier. The project will give them more info about the chances of strong winds, large hail, and even tornadoes. Currently, warnings are created by forecasters looking at the atmosphere outside, understanding its volatility, and then comparing that to how they see the Doppler radar presenting what's going on inside the thunderstorms. One on forecast is an idea where we're going to take the massive amounts of satellite, radar, and surface data and stick them all into a very high resolution prediction model. And then by producing new forecasts every 15 or 20 minutes, the forecasters hopefully will be able to use that model to produce warnings that extend out to an hour. Before the National Weather Service can use this tool, it must be developed and tested. One big challenge will be deciding how to get the model predictions to the forecasters. I'm going to keep this one very low, I'm just adjusting the track. These hazardous weather prediction models are going to produce a huge amount of output. And this fire hose of data is just too much for forecasters to handle in real time quickly. So in order to help deal with that, NSSL has developed a related project called FACETS. And FACETS is the methodology which will enable forecasters to focus very quickly on the most important threats. Once worn on forecasts and FACETS are proven to be reliable and effective, then forecasters will be better able to inform you of threats nearby. Learn more here and follow us. Hazardous Weather Test Bed is located at the National Weather Center in Norman, Oklahoma. It is used for experiments that will allow forecasters to learn and apply new technologies. The Hazardous Weather Test Bed is a really unique space throughout all of NOAA. And this is where the researchers and the operational folks come together in a common space to solve operational problems and to test new research tools that the research community is working on. The goal is to accelerate the transfer from research to operations of the newest tools and techniques. People come from around the world to collaborate on this unique project. We can bring together not only NOAA people, but also university people, faculty, uh, researchers, uh, private sector meteorologists, folks working in other countries in meteorology, forecasters can all come together and focus on what the problem of the day is with the forecasters. 
Each spring, several experiments occur in the hazardous weather test bed. Learn more here and follow us. What are you looking at? And what are you ignoring? Did you notice the NOAA logo in the corner? Forecasters have a lot of information in front of them too. Every second counts during severe weather and decisions about where to focus are constantly being made. This could be even more challenging in the future. Phased array radar will produce four to six times more information than what we have now, which brings us to the question researchers are hoping to answer. Will more radar information affect forecasters' decisions? From our past experiments, we've learned a lot about how forecasters think uh, during the warning decision process, but we've also learned that those thought processes are very complex, and for that reason, we need a better way to be able to track forecasters' cognitive activity. Inbounds and possibly golf ball sized tails. And eye tracker is a piece of technology that is used to determine in real time where someone's eye gaze is located. And these eye trackers are typically video based, which means a camera sits below a computer monitor and with infrared light and vector analysis, we can determine where a person is looking and how their eyes are moving. Eye tracking is already being used in the medical field and air traffic control. Using similar research methods, NSSL is discovering the benefit for weather forecasting too. Phased array radar will give forecasters a lot more to think about. Understanding their decision-making process will help researchers develop even more user-friendly tools. So what's the benefit for you? Even better weather warnings. To learn more, check us out online and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Welcome back. Looking at today's sea ice analysis, uh, no change really, not a lot. Uh, just the uh, ice fields here shifting around with the currents and the winds a little bit there. Uh, quite a thin area here uh, north of the eastern Arctic coast, except for this heavy ice along the end, north of the Barren Islands. And not much change, no big changes, again, for the next five days. Coastal water forecast here. Small craft advisories tomorrow, that front edging its way eastward, 25 knot winds from the south on the south coast, otherwise southeast 25 for the remainder of the coastline, seas up to 8 feet. Winds uh, picking up to about 20 knots for Clarence Strait from the southeast, southeast 15, Stevens Passage, and northern Lynn Canal, southerly is at 20 knots, seas at 4 feet. And the outlook for uh, Wednesday. <laughs> South 15 there for Lynn Canal, same thing for Stevens, or for Clarence Strait. Stevens Passage a little lighter south at 10, seas 2 feet, and lighter winds here along the coast. Uh, south coast still west 20 with 7 foot seas, but down to 15 knots from the west northwest on the north side there with uh, 6 to 7 foot seas. Prince William Sound tomorrow, we've got uh, easterly winds of 15 with seas at 3 feet, but good small craft advisories just under gale force here for the eastern north Gulf Coast at 30 knots, and then Cut that in half for the west side, east 15, turning northwest 15 for the Barren Islands, northeast 15 here for uh, Kamishak Bay, south to southwest at 15 for Cook Inlet with two to three foot seas. And then uh, even lighter winds in store for uh, Wednesday, variable winds uh, becoming south at 10 in the afternoon for Cook Inlet, seas only two feet, but small craft advisories return to Kamishak Bay and the Barrens. Both west 25, light and variable winds here for the North Gulf Coast at 10 knots or less, three to four foot seas, light westerlies in Prince William Sound. And for uh, Kodiak Island, uh, west 20 knots there for the east side zones and Shelikoff Strait west at 15. And then for the Alaska Peninsula, west winds 20 knots, 20 knots right on up to uh, Sitkanak and southwest 15 for Bristol Bay. Outlook for Wednesday, small craft advisories here for Bristol Bay, west 25 knots, seas building to 6 feet, otherwise northwest 20 for the peninsula, and west 20 from uh, Castle Cape to Sitkanak, and then small craft advisories, west winds 25 knots up the uh, eastern marine zones here with seas at 7 feet. And for the Fox Islands tomorrow, west winds mostly 20 knots, uh, seas 5 to 6 feet, Lighter winds for Adak and Atka, southwest just 10 to 15 with three to four foot seas turning uh, variable and then becoming southeast 15, turning northeast 15 
for the far western zone. And then on Wednesday, swings around, again, weak, low pressure out in this area. So uh, just 15 knots from the south, four-foot seas, light and variable here over until you get to Adak and Atka, and then it's south, 10 to 15. And not too bad wind-wise for the Fox Islands. Looks like the highest winds will be across on Alaska Island, northwest, 15 to 20 knots, seas running four to five feet. Along the southwest coast, look for northwesterlies at 20 tomorrow with uh, those seas at about 4 feet. Same thing for the uh, Pribilofs, northwest 20, as well as St. Matthew Island, west 20, St. Lawrence Island, and Norton Sound, uh, northwest at 15. I'll look for Wednesday, westerlies 15 for the Sound and St. Lawrence Island, west 20 now along the uh, yukon Cusquamdela coastline, west 20 for the Pribilofs. Small craft advisories over St. Matthew Island, Northern Bering Sea for west winds at 25 knots. And uh, the area from Wales up to Cape Thompson, southwest 15, sees three feet. And then uh, Cape Thompson up the west side there, north to northeast, only 10 knots of the central coast, turning south 15, east central coast, and then over toward demarcation point east of 15. And then uh, 10 knot winds for all of the Arctic coast tomorrow, northeast on the extreme east side here, turning north and then northwest on the central coast, turning west on the west coast, and then uh, northerlies from Cape Beaufort to Wales only at 10 knots. For tonight, uh, again, a series of disturbances keep passing along the Arctic coast here with periods of rain. A little bit of an increase in the winds, but nothing too serious really. You could see some minor beach erosion if those seas rise to five feet. Uh, diminishing showers, thunderstorms, uh, over the state again tonight, uh, but lingering along the North Gulf Coast, showers and drizzle, fog, IFR, Bering Sea, and the Pribilofs, and this system will spread rain into the Panhandle tomorrow, and will be mostly along the eastern North Gulf Coast or southward. Some of that could slip into the Seward Peninsula again. Thunderstorms mid-afternoon, southern Alaska, and for Wednesday, looks like some rain over the southern Panhandle, increasing sunshine, southern Alaska, and thunderstorms again over the eastern interior. And that's it for Real Weather tonight. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again tomorrow. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbormaster before you go boating.